one, so go ahead and uh, press the red arrow. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning and welcome to Fundamentals of Occlusion. My name is Sarah and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Um, I want to begin by going over a few housekeeping items. First, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a question box. So at any time during the webinar you have any questions, please feel free to type those in. Uh, we will be answering um, any and all questions at the end of the webinar. Um, in addition, uh, the course is NBC approved for one, quest, one, one credit hour. So within about 24 hours, you'll receive information on how to obtain your CE credit. And we'll also be posting this webinar on our website. So in case you missed any portion of it or would like another review, you can just log on to witness.com uh, and uh, view it again at your own time. Now without further, uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Craig Pickett. For those of you that do not know, Craig is our technical support manager here at Whitmix and has over 25 years experience in the dental laboratory field. So, Craig? All right, good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Um, as advertised, this is really a course for beginners and aimed at beginners. For those of you who want to also to review some of these terms and uh, basic kinds of occlusion, uh, methods. Now, some of you who have more intricate or complicated uh, questions may want to go ahead and email those questions uh, to us here at Whitmix. At, uh, you can reach me directly at cticket at whitmix.com uh, and we can answer those uh, questions for you. I want to stay kind of on a, on a level that's a little bit more simple and uh, basic today if possible. Um, Let's go ahead and we'll start right off, uh, except that my, uh, <laughs> my clicker is not working at the moment. It was and is not currently, uh, so we'll get to it. Here we go. Uh, thank you. It's always good to have good technical help with you. Appreciate it, Sarah. All right. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize and realize that dentistry has a common language. If you cannot speak or write this common language, uh, then you cannot communicate in our industry. And so, although we have pet names for things and, and various kinds of uh, ways that we talk about stuff, we need to understand and use that common language. And so because of that, we're going to go over some of those common terms for today. Now, depending upon where your dentist or you as a technician went to school, there are going to be different names and terms for different structures of the mouth. And you need to be fluent in uh, all of those terms that relate to your individual dentist. Uh, so please make sure that uh, you're capturing that information and are able to communicate back to him with the same language uh, that he learned or she learned in school. Um, now, we're going to start right off with reference planes. Planes are a flat section which are defined by at least three points in space. Uh, the body and teeth are all divided into various planes. And you can see in this particular illustration, we have a frontal plane, we have a, a horizontal plane, and then we all have a, also have a sagittal plane. And sagittal plane can occur on either side of that uh, uh, frontal or median plane. Now, here we are translating directly into the head and neck, and you'll notice we have what is called the frontal plane once again. And also referenced is what's called the mid-sagittal plane, which would be the same as the medial or the median plane. Now, we're often talking, too, about the plane of occlusion. And that plane, of course, is described as that relationship between the upper and lower teeth uh, as they come together in a natural bite. We also use, commonly, the curve of speed. This is that angle or that curve which extends from the anterior of the teeth to the posterior of the teeth. Um, in crown and bridge, we're generally just following whatever angles happen to be there uh, relative to the uh, remaining uh, dentition, which is there. Uh, these curves are used a lot more uh, by those that are practicing removable uh, restoration dentistry and are terribly important to them. 
uh, in Crown Bridge we get we fly a little loose with curve of speed. The other one is curve of Wilson, uh, which is a curve that extends from one side of the mouth to the other and generally follows that inclination that the teeth have to fall what we will call lingually um, or uh, towards the tongue. Now there's also something called the sphere of Monson. Uh, this uh, is uh, described by the combination of the curve of Wilson and the curve of speed. And uh, it's a shape that's roughly the size of a tennis ball that occurs at the, at the base. It, this is not the best illustration, but I think you can see it. Now we also have what is called the Bonwell, uh, which is a triangle, an equilateral triangle. Um, this is based on uh, 10 centimeters or 110 millimeters of space, uh, which occurs between the condyles of uh, the mandible and the lower, in, uh, the central point of the lower incisors. And a lot of what we will base um, uh, the theory of occlusion around articulation is based on Bonwell. All right, now we also use the Frankfurt horizontal plane. Um, this is established, as you can see, uh, in large words, by the transverse horizontal axis of the mandible with a point on the inferior border of the right or left orbit, or what is called the orbitale. Um, the orbit is that piece at the bottom of the eye there, and it runs through the central part of your ear. And this is that plane that most face bows use as a beginning point uh, of measurement. And we'll look at that in just a second. Uh, there's a typical registration. This is using the Whitmix face flow. You can see the Frankfurt plane there is the, uh, is the actual bow, the, the legs of the bow there, uh, that are placed into the patient's ear and are positioned, in the case of the Whitmix unit, by the nasion. And then the bite fork, which is held in the patient's mouth, registers the occlusal table in relationship to that Frankfurt plane. And then this information is held by the uh, face flow registration and transferred to a large frame articulate. Now, we're using some initials now uh, that weren't used many years ago. MI is the first one. This is maximal intercustation. Uh, this uh, occurs when the jaws are closed and the, the teeth are all positioned correctly in what we used to call cusp fossa relationship. Uh, that's our standard closer point that we're looking for in crown and bridge a lot uh, because that's the relationship left with the teeth that we're working with. Uh, in removable, it's something that you're finding and creating. Now, uh, there are two uh, reference points that are sometimes confusing many technicians that are talked about now. The first one is centric occlusion. Uh, this refers to that relationship of the mandible to the maxilla when the teeth are in MI. So when you're in a closed position, uh, teeth are all together in the natural spot that they fall. Um, this is CO. Now, if you look at the illustration at the top, uh, where the condylar disc assembly would be, you'll notice that it may or may not be forward or backwards uh, in the fossa. And this is going to be dependent upon, of course, the individual patient, uh, where exactly that falls. But we're relying on centric occlusion, or CO, based on position of the teeth. The next one is CR. And this relationship, or centric relation, is where the mandible uh, is in the most superior or the highest position against the eminentia. Uh, so it's back and up, if you would. And you'll notice that in the top of the illustration there. It's seated properly. The other thing you'll notice that this is irrespective of the position of the teeth. They may or may not be occluded correctly. Uh, and more than likely, they're not. And the variance of that is going to be based on the individual patient. All right, now let's talk about some structure. Uh, all technicians ought to know the general structures or parts of the tooth. 
um, the crown, the neck area, the root area. Uh, you should you should know what is the enamel, what is the dentin, what is the pulp chamber, and the pulp. You should know where the apical foramen is. You should know that uh, there is an alveolar process, which is the bone that surrounds the roots of the teeth. You should know also that they're held in place by the periodontal ligament, not by the bone, and uh, that there is a blood and nerve uh, supply that runs through that apical foramen and into uh, the rest of the pulp that keeps the teeth alive. Now, you should know the relationship between what is referred to as the clinical crown, or that portion of the tooth that is above uh, the, the gingiva, or the gums of the teeth, versus the neck area, which is closest to the gingiva, and then the root. If we don't design that properly, then we begin to have problems in that area, and we have uh, what is, or can be, uh, turned into periodontal problems or problems with periodontal ligaments. So it's important that you understand that relationship and how those structures uh, meet and function together. Now, the maxilla is uh, that part of the skull that supports the upper teeth. It is not a mobile part of the, of the head. Uh, we often, in, in using an articulator, are moving the upper member of the articulator around and we lose track of the fact that uh, that piece in the human body actually stays fairly rigid. Uh, and there's the mandible, which is also known as the jaw. And this is, of course, the lower member of the oral cavity. Uh, this is the piece that moves when we're actually chewing uh, and supports the lower teeth. There are various pieces of that mandible that you can, of course, study later. Um, the piece that becomes important to you as you look at function of the jaw is really the conjugate process and how that process fits into the uh, faucet. All right, now we have the palate, which is composed of two parts, the soft and the hard. Uh, this is the upper portion of your oral cavity. Uh, Crown bridge technicians don't refer very often to some of the landmarks there, but the removable guys do. There's the size of the pillow, which will mark your center position if you do not have teeth remaining. And there's my favorite, which is the palatine rugae, or rugae, depending upon where you were schooled and how you pronounce. Uh, it's terribly important for speech. Uh, and uh, can be uh, problematic if it's not reproduced in removable uh, uh, restoration. So uh, a lot of the removable guys out there will use uh, wax patterns that are already produced, or perhaps have even uh, somehow uh, done an impression, created their own, and have a block of plaster designed now to impress the rude into, into soft wax. Then we have the TMJ. Now the TMJ, or the temporal mandibular joint, is a study in and of itself. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. Uh, what you need to know, basically, is that that's where the maxilla and the mandible tie together. This is the site where the condyles uh, rotate and translate uh, inside the fossa. It has a lot of different parts that are all involved, and as those parts wear or deteriorate and come into all kinds of uh, related problems. Uh, we call these or refer to them as TMJ disorders. And they can include headache, migraine, abnormal tooth wear, masturbatory discomfort, speech irregularities, and in many cases, there's pain that can't be quite diagnosed. Um, if you look at this slide, you can see normal uh, positioning and normal movement uh, in the top two left and central uh, slide pictures there. And then you can see what happens when you have an abnormal movement of that joint. And uh, the impinging effect that it has on the disc uh, during muscle displacement. There's a lot that goes on with that. It's a specialty field. Uh, and if you encounter or are told that you have a patient with TMJ disorder, and as you're doing your 
reproductive work uh, with those teeth, you're going to need to make sure that uh, you're in good, close communication with the restoring dentist so that uh, you can help to overcome as much of that issue as possible. Now, let's do some direction. These are kind of classic and basic. Anterior is towards the front of the face or the front of the mouth. Every tooth has an anterior surface. Uh, the next one, of course, is the posterior, which means towards the back of the mouth. This uh, is the position of anything that is towards the back of the mouth or the head can be re referred to as posterior. And usually when we say the posterior teeth, we're talking about that group of teeth that includes the bicuspids or premolars and the molars. Now, we also have mesial, which means the surface that is most close toward the mesial or the median line, that central line of structure. You can see it uh, in the example that's up there on the screen. Uh, each and every tooth, as you go, has a mesial surface. Next one is distal. That's probably the easiest one to remember because it's the most distant from that median line. Then you have the occlusal surface. This surface is the surface that comes into occlusion or contact with the opposing uh, dentition. It's also referred to as the chewing surface or the top surface of the teeth. Then you also have the lingual surface, which is the surface closest to the tongue on your teeth. Now that surface uh, can also be referred to in the upper uh, teeth as the palatal surface because it's the surface most close to the palate. Uh, this will depend upon where your doctors or where you went to school, but don't be surprised if those terms are used in a Then we have the buccal surface. This is the side of the tooth closest to the buccinator muscle which is the outside surface of posterior teeth. The next one is the facial or the labial surface, and that's the uh, surface which comes in contact with the face or the front portion of your face or the, the labia or the lips. And both of those terms can be used interchangeably. The next one that's used a lot is lateral, and that simply means to the side of. Uh, any surface could be lateral, just depending upon where you're looking from. Now, the other thing that's important to know and understand is the long axis of the tooth. Every tooth has a long axis. Uh, with the crown and bridge folks, we're seeing a prepped tooth. And to envision placement, then, of the clinical crown that you're going to create, you need to also understand where the long axis of that tooth is running so that you can position that crown properly for its later uh, loading that will take place. Um, for the removable guys, long axis, you've got a denture tooth there that you're placing, and that rotation is going to be important, too, to understand where you're placing those denture teeth. So long axis. Then we have anterior landmarks. These are, are found on any of the anterior teeth, both the upper and the lower. And uh, one that uh, is, sticks out is that uh, anterior teeth also have marginal ridges. A lot of times we don't uh, talk about that. But you'll see that, that there are several landmarks, including the incisal ridge that we're familiar with, the cingulum, which is the number seven on your screen there. Uh, and also the junction, the cemental enamel junction. And of course, there is a lingual cloth that is involved there. Most technicians forget that those anterior teeth have a cloth. Then we have posterior occlusal landmarks, and this is significantly more. Um, I won't go through every one of them, but you'll notice the basics up there are the cusps, the grooves, and the ridges. Uh, and the fossa, or the, uh, what can also be known as the pit, which is at the bottom. Now we have different types of identifying systems for each tooth. The first 
first one that we're going to talk about here is the numerical system. Uh, in my mind, this is the easiest one to communicate with because each tooth has its own number. You begin at the patient's upper right third molar. So if you'll take your hand and uh, finger, just point to your upper right uh, third molar, which would be where your wisdom tooth is or was. Uh, that continues to hold that numerical space, whether it's been extracted or not. That's your number one. And then you count around each tooth until uh, you get to 16 on your upper left-hand side, drop straight down. That would be 17 on the lower left-hand side and then come all the way around uh, to number 32. You always uh, reference each tooth once again, whether it's been extracted or not, it's still that position. Uh, this is simple, I think. If I am talking with you over the telephone and just say um, we're referring to tooth number nine, you know that that is the upper left central. It's, it's just easy. Now the next one is the Palmer or the military system, and you'll notice that the teeth have been broken into quadrants, and each quadrant is numbered one through eight. Um, you'll see under the example on the left side of your screen there uh, how to write each of these. There's a bracket, and then going in the correct direction. Uh, with the example, this would be the patient's upper left number one, which would be the number nine tooth uh, in the other system. Um, the thing that can be a little bit uh, discouraging about this particular system, especially here, is that if it's not written properly, it can look like L1, and that can be confusing at times. Uh, you can confuse that with lower one. Um, and so we have to watch that and know that your particular doctor is using this system. Now, the, the third system that's out there is the international system. Um, this, once again, is broken into quadrants, uh, being numbered 1 through 8. Uh, the teeth are numbered 1 through 8. And each quadrant is also given a number. And so if we use that same example of the number 9 tooth, which is patient's upper left, uh, central incisor, that would be 2-1. Or uh, in the uh, examples that I used here, the upper right third molar is 1-8, and the lower left third molar is 3-8. Um, sometimes the confusion there, for example, if you use the upper right third molar uh, and you miss the dash, you get tooth number 18, which is a completely different tooth, of course. So the uh, the the onus is on the technician to understand the communication system uh, that the dentist is using. Now, when it comes to uh, the names of the teeth, some teeth have dual names. Uh, canines are often called cuspids. Uh, premolars are called bicuspids. Third molar is often called a wisdom tooth. And we go through it uh, as we go. Um, They'll often be referred to interchangeably, and so you need to be familiar with each of those names of the teeth. Now, in primary teeth or baby teeth, it's a little bit different. The identifiers are not uh, numbers, but they are letters. They start with, once again, the patient's upper right molar as A, and then runs around B, C, D, F, uh, e, F, G, H, I, et cetera. Um, the names, however, are the same. You're still going to call it a central incisor, a lateral incisor, a canine or a cuspid, a first molar, second molar. Now let's talk about uh, the muscles of mastication. Uh, those of you who went through school went through this and probably groaned uh, as you did. But it's important to know basically which muscles are doing what and how they function. Um, and then if you want to get into all the names of the muscles, you certainly can. Uh, they're broken into groups. And the first group we're going to talk about are the elevator muscles. These are the muscles that lift the mandible up against the maxilla. 
and create the chewing motion. Okay, they are the masseter, the medial pterygoid, and the temporalis, and uh, here they are. Uh, there are also positioner muscles. These help to position that mandible in the correct uh, spot for what it is that you're going to do. Those uh, are the lateral pterygoid and the temporalis. Then we have muscles of speech and swallowing. They include the buccinator, the orbicularisaurus, the tongue, and the depressor muscle as a group. Now, the masseter, uh, or before we go there, we should tell you that all muscles have an origin, an insertion, and a function. The origin is where that muscle begins. The insertion is where it ends or connects to. Um, and if you look at this example of the masseter, you'll see the origin up on the uh, up on the, uh, the uh, uh, I just lost it for a moment, sorry, on the maxilla, uh, and the insertion down on the, or excuse me, on the mandible, and the insertion on the lateral surface of the, of the ramus coronoid process, which is up on the, uh, on the mandible. There we go. Let's review that again, just so I didn't confuse you. Uh, the origin up on the zygomatic arch, which is on the next so the insertion on the mandible. Now, what's its function? It elevates the mandible and clenches the teeth. So you can feel that if you'll put your, your, uh, your hand left or right up on the side of your face near that lower uh, portion of your jaw where it angles up. And then go ahead and clench your teeth and you can feel that muscle. Uh, function. Now, the medial pterygoid. This also helps to elevate. Okay? And there it is. You can see its position. The temporalis is that large banded muscle that actually is where uh, you can, where you feel migraine headaches. Those of you who get that, uh, you know where that kind of feeling is up there on the right, on the side of your head. If you put your palm up on the side of your head and then uh, close your jaw and clench, you can feel that muscle working. The next one is the lateral pterygoid. That's kind of a tough muscle to feel working. You have to dig around a bit to find that one. Uh, but as you move your jaw back and forth a bit, if you really reach in there, uh, just uh, about where your ear is, uh, just in front of your ear, you can uh, you can feel that little muscle working around. Okay, it holds the the, the disc your uh, disc over the condyle and uh, pulls the mandible down and forward. Okay, which is important as you move into uh, into your uh, portrait. A protrusive position of the man. Okay, then we have the buccinator muscle. Remember back we had the buc buccal surface of the teeth. Um, this function compresses your teeth and it aids in mastication of chewing. And its function really is to push the food that falls off the occlusal table back onto the occlusal table. The next one is the orbicularisaurus. That was my favorite to remember. Just kind of has an interesting sounding name, orbicularisaurus. Uh, its function is lips and facial expression. Now, it used to be thought of as a sphincter muscle, a single muscle in a circle that closed and opened. Uh, but now it's really been defined as four separate muscles that function together. And if you think of that, you'll know then why Elvis was uh, capable of making that kind of uh, uh, left lip lift that he did, is because he could pull up uh, that one side of the orbicular sore. All right, then we have the tongue, which is also a muscle. And of course, it helps us in speech and swallowing and chewing, because it pushes from the, the food from the interior surface back onto the table of, of the table table to chew. And then we have a 
whole group of muscles called the compressor muscle that help to pull the mantle down. This is the myotyoid, the digastric, and the stylohyoid. Those of you who uh, get allergies and the back of the, or the upper bit of your palate, the back side of your throat itches a lot, you use that muscle to get your tongue up there to try and scratch it. All right, now let's talk a little bit about occlusion and function. And once again, as I said, this is a very high level uh, conversation, if not in depth. If you want to get more into depth about that, we've got some great folks here at Whitman uh, that are all capable of talking to you about occlusion and function. Uh, simply said, occlusion is defined as making contact with the surface of an opposing tooth when the jaws are closed. Uh, we talk about that in terms, as technician in terms of how the teeth are going to fit together and close on each other. We know it's a lot more than that because it has to do with movement. And it has to do with individual movement of individual patients. And that movement is defined by everything that we've been talking about, about the tooth surface, about the shape of the condyle, about their muscles and how they operate, whether or not they have TMJ disorder, all those kinds of things combined. We generally will break occlusion into three different classes. First one is a class one occlusion. These are teeth that are aligned in cusp-fossa relationship with their antagonist tooth or the tooth opposite. Uh, we often call this normal occlusion, although all of the, the both the other classes are pretty normal too. But uh, but this is the the standard of occlusion that we try to get. The second, or class two occlusion, is when we have the anterior maxillary teeth protruded or pushing forward horizontally, horizontally over the mandibular teeth. Uh, you'll notice too that the position of the buccal cusp tips have also moved forward, but it should be class one. And we also call this overjet. Overbite uh, is another term that's often used. That's the depth that, that you bite over, uh, that your anterior, uh, upper anterior incisors bite over the lower incisors. Overjet is how far forward you come. Then we have what's called class three occlusion. This is where the anterior maxillary dentition are behind or posterior to the mandibular anterior teeth. Uh, posterior teeth are usually in crossbite, uh, which means that they've also moved position, the upper teeth, into the inside of the occlusal table rather than outside those cusps. Or, or the teeth rest inside the fossa of the lower dentition. Uh, this can cause some real interesting sort of bite relationships and restorative uh, problems with function as you create uh, teeth that need to move in that relationship rather than standard or class one uh, relationship. So you need to be very careful as you produce those tests. Things which uh, look very nice may actually be interfering in the function of a, of a bite line. All right, now, function is a broad term also. It is defined, uh, as we see here, as a factor related to or dependent upon other factors, which is a pretty vague definition. You will notice uh, on the right-hand side of the screen that we've listed basically the peak as a group, incisors, canines, premolars, molars, and third molars. And then we've given you a definition of what that function is. Uh, the incisors are those eight teeth in the front and center of your mouth. These are the ones you use to take bites out of your food. Uh, they're referred to as the cutting that teeth, if you would, at times. Uh, they generally develop around uh, six months for that first or primary 
primary set and between six and eight years uh, for your adult set of teeth. That's our favorite photographs we ever had of ourselves where our two front anterior teeth look like they're about three times the size of our face. Uh, everybody's got one of those. Generally, nobody pulls that picture out to show anyone. Uh, it's kind of that funny stage in those kids' blood. The next one are, of course, the canines. These are ripping or tearing teeth. They are what associates us uh, with some of the other uh, predatory animals that are out there, if you would, that all have these sort of meat-eater uh, type of teeth in their mouth. Um, these teeth are, uh, when they come in as permanent, uh, also serve as a uh, movement regulator, they allow for uh, the occlusal table to be disengaged and can be worn quite regularly and can be worn off flat. We need to be on the lookout for that kind of restoration also. Premolars uh, can also be referred to as bicuspids, having two cusps. They're used for chewing and grinding food. Uh, you have four of them on side of your mouth up and lower, and uh, can develop uh, around age 10 uh, is your permanent. Molars are your uh, primary method for chewing or grinding your food. And then the third molar, which is commonly known as wisdom tooth, are often removed. Uh, it's said to be uh, basically not important. Uh, sometimes they get in the way. Sometimes they will erupt uh, in an impacted state where, where they don't have a clear channel to come up and uh, therefore be removed so that they don't affect the rest of the dentition Now, They will have a tendency at times if they're coming in crooked to push the other teeth in your mouth forward and misalign them, uh, and that could be problematic also. Now, there are functional movements of the jaw. Uh, we refer to these as protrusive. That's where your jaw uh, comes forward. Uh, retrusive, where it moves backwards. Left lateral movement, which is moving to the left. Right lateral movement to the right. Side shift, which is an immediate sort of a movement. Immediate side shift. And then there is rotation, which is a, a turning movement that the, that the uh, Ramus uh, makes in the condyle, and translation, which is another movement as it moves forward and down uh, the condyle, the upper portion of the condyle. So you've got a lot of functional movements that go on with that jaw, not just open and closed. And that brings us to articulation, which is uh, a rather large topic, and we're really going to talk just about a couple of three things, and that's the three basic types of articulators that are out there. And uh, we're also going to talk uh, for a moment here about what's referred to as arc of closure, which is an interesting thing because it affects all of us, uh, especially in Crown and Bridge, where there are so many varieties of uh, articulators that are being used currently. Now, an articulator is a mechanical device that simulates the mandibular movement, uh, and that can be a device that simulates it fairly accurately, and also one that doesn't really simulate it, uh, that acts purely as a hinge movement. Now, your larger articulators, uh, like the Whitmix that's shown in the uh, bottom right-hand corner, uh, helps you to mimic the actual movement of the, the uh, condyle in their fossa, and uh, as does uh, any of the other larger articulators. Uh, we here at Whitmix now uh, are producing both the Whitmix articulator, the Danar series of articulators, and also the Hanau series of articulators uh, for your use. Now, a semi-adjustable articulator provides a platform for the use of as much diagnostic information as there is possible really out there now. There are 
uh, fully adjustable articulators on the market, like the Danar D5A. Uh, they're not uh, in use a lot because of the complexity. Uh, and so you will see most of the larger articulators uh, that are on the market are semi-adjustable, meaning that they're, they cannot be adjusted for every movement uh, that goes on and each and every size of the patient's uh, head. Uh, here's a, this is an example of a Hanau articulator. Um, you can see here where the Frankfurt plane, you'll remember that was the, the horizontal plane extending from the, the, basically from the ear to the orbitale, which is the bottom, uh, the bony ridge there at the bottom of your eye socket. Um, and uh, the occlusal plane, which is that uh, piece defined by where the teeth uh, intersect, and remember that this is the information that we would capture using a FACEBO registration. That FACEBO registration would be then transferred to the articulator, and uh, that would also give you uh, your correct relationship back to the fossa, which is indicated there uh, on that articulate. Okay. When you mount a case like this, you get the maximum amount or the majority of the corrected information that you need from the dentist. Now, most of us are not working with a majority of dentists using facial registration. And so we uh, deal with registrations that uh, may simply be a quick bite registration and don't give us the information relative to the condyles in the patient. Um, that requires us then to do what's called arbitrary mounting. Now we're going to do a webinar later uh, here in the year on arbitrary mounting and how to deal with that. Uh, there are some tricks to that that will give you a little better uh, mounting relationship with uh, with the articulator and therefore a little more uh, like the original patient. Hang on one second, we'll get to uh, moving a... There we go. Uh, here you can see the side view of a patient and a a Dana articulator that has a case mounted on it, placed in the relative position of how it would mimic that patient. The most the condyles is approximately the same place where the uh, head of the ramus there would be for the mandible and where it attaches into the maxilla. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the teeth uh, the models are coming together in the occlusal plane right where they should be. Uh, this is because this full-size articulator allows for the correct positioning of all of those relationships. Now, this yellow circle is going to give you that uh, occlusal relationship okay, from the condyle. The it's the uh, the, uh, not Frankfurt plane, but I just lost its name. <laughs> but the triangle, we'll get to it. Uh, sorry, everyone. Uh, that creates that. Uh, that's about 110 degree, or it's about 110 uh, millimeter uh, measurement from that point to the lower incisors and, uh, and gives us correct positioning in general. Okay, with the exception, of course, that every patient's just a little bit different. But just on average, that's where we are. Okay? Now, if we're using a foster type articulator, which has been very popular over many years, uh, this would be the position that that would be in if we kept the occlusal plane in the same uh, correct position. And you will notice with the placement of this articulator. 
that we have a change in the, the relative position of where that hinge access is or where uh, we would normally put the condyle. The distance we're trying to mimic in Bonwell, which is the uh, triangle I was trying to think of a moment ago, sorry about that, uh, is approximately the same, but you'll notice that there's a position change if you look at the green circle relative to what's going on with the yellow circle, which would be the standard. Now, what we're getting to here is what's called the arc of closure. And uh, we'll talk about that as we reference all three types of articulate. Now, the probably the most common articulator that's in use in the Crown Bridge side of the world is a disposable articulator. There are several different kinds out there. Uh, this is probably a very popular one. And uh, you'll notice what happens with the position of the conduct. Now, the occlusal plane is in the same space. However, uh, as we measure the position of the condyle, you'll notice that it has moved dramatically from where the patient's actual condyle is and where the position would be if you were using a semi-adjustable or large-scale, full-scale articulate. You'll also notice with that orange circle that that arc has changed dramatically from the arc which is there with the yellow circle. Now, the correct or incorrect application of articulators can lead to clinical success or failure, depending upon what you're producing. Now, as I said earlier on, Crown and Bridge, we're using a lot of the existing dentition that is there to give us the landmarks of movement and function. As we move into dentalist cases, uh, you have problems there. Uh, or edentalists, you have problems when you have no teeth left to reference, and you move into an articulator that is not a large-scale articulator, which is, uh, gives you a change in the movement. There's all three of them laid on top of each other. And if you were to, in your mind, imagine a central lined up along the long axis with each of those yellow, green, and orange lines, you'll notice that the tilt or the angulation of that central changes. The movement of the central then would change also. Much more shallow angle, much different angle of attack as you come through. What we're noticing and finding is that this is creating problems, especially in the posterior region, with early contact or what is often called high occlusion. And so to combat that, we simply take the cusp tips out of occlusion, uh, sometimes as many as two or three tapes uh, short, and uh, just so that there's no interference when the doctor gives the case back. Now, this isn't ideal. I think we all know as technicians it's not ideal. But in part, we've created our own problem by working on disposable articulators, which are convenient, but not the best application of the information. What we want to do is to make sure that we keep our dentition functioning. Uh, it's a little tougher to recreate without the proper dentition. And without the proper function, it leads us into TMJ issues and other kinds of problematic uh, responses from patients. Now, once again, this was a very high overview of many of these terms of occlusion and function. Uh, and we would, here at Whitmix, encourage you to be involved with studying function and looking at how dentition actually works together, how the muscles promote that uh, function, what they do, and how each and every case differs.
therefore allowing you to produce the best restorative product you can possibly produce for that patient. We encourage you to ask questions. We encourage you to study. If uh, you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we'll reference you on the different reference material uh, for reading and study. And, uh, and please, please don't hesitate to give us a call. All right, so I just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and type them in the questions box on the right-hand um, corner of your screen. Um, also, we had a lot of latecomers today, so if you did miss a portion of today's webinar, it will be up on our website by tomorrow, so feel free to watch it there in your own time. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and type them. We'll, we'll kind of stick on here for a little bit. Um, but we do have some upcoming webinars. Um, coming up in August, we have Lean in the Model Room. Uh, we also have Getting the Most from Your Articulator. And in September, we have Arbitrary Mounting, which Craig had mentioned earlier. And then in October, we have our Whitmix Lean Symposium of Dental Technology. And you can actually log on to Whitmix.com for more information on that. Uh, there's still no questions coming in, so um, we're going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Um, if you have um, or need PDT credit, we will be sending out um, information on how to obtain that credit. Um, you should get that within 24 to 48 hours of today's webinar. Um, and if you have um, any questions in addition to that, please email us at uh, cpicket at witnix.com or uh, webinar at witnix.com as well. So thank you all for your uh, attention today, and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you.